Hello and welcome to the Jim Powell Report. I'm your host, Jim Powell, and we have a magnificent guest today. We have Margot Datz. She's a wonderful author and artist. We're so blessed and fortunate to have her here on our show today. We've been having a great time conversing, and we know that you'll love the show. Glad you're here. Margot, thanks for coming here today. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Thank you. You know, this past winter, I was um, at the university in between classes I was just thinking about coming home and uh, you know there's been so much uh, gobbledygook in the news and I thought you know what I don't want that to influence my summer and I want other people to have good thoughts and positive thoughts so let's share the positivity and the goodness and help other people feel that and remember that so as I was thinking who best shows and illustrates that positivity and of all the different people we have many many talented people here on Martha's Vineyard I do. and I just started thinking Margot Dads boom right at the top of the list Thank you. so when I called you at home and we just conversed it opened up and here we are today great to have you here Thank you so much. I'm very uh, happy to be here and happy to sh share with you whatever I have to share. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a lot to share, and we're only limited by our uh, interview here today. But our guests are going to be interested to know a little chronology. You are a, a world-renowned uh, author and sculptor and artist, and anyone coming to Martha's Vineyard, walking through any of the the, the beautiful buildings in Edgartown, the Whaling Church, or the Steamship Authority, or, or the uh, Arts uh, Performing Arts Center, or different places, um, will see your handiwork and your influence and your artistry. Um, but I thought we'd just start with a little chronology of that you grew up in upstate central New York in the Finger Lakes region. Baby you, Finger, you Skinny want, Atlas. You want to talk about that? Well, it was a beautiful place to to grow up very kind of small town to rural fecund uh, Scanny Atlas now has become like destination desirable for central New York but when I was growing up there the big deal was a cabbage truck driving through town and maybe a cabbage would fall off of it you know <laughs> <laughs> and I just grew up in the woods and mm -hmm. uh, knew every flower every bird every tree it was a, it was a wonderful childhood mm -hmm. And then as you grew up, got into your 20s, you, you lived in Greenwich Village. I did. I, I, I went to college for three and a half years, uh, actually four, uh, through the SUNY system. And mm -hmm. we had some winters. Mm, yeah. uh, but then, I, you know, the bigger world called me, and I got to live in Greenwich Village, which was really exciting. And I moved to San Francisco uh, just in time to catch a... Led Zeppelin concert at Haight Ashbury, and I got homesick. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, there's a big nature girl in me. I uh, moved back and then moved right down to New Orleans, and I, I spent four years in New Orleans, which was just one of the best things that had ever happened to me. Uh -huh, and being exposed to the, the old uh, architecture and the food and the music being around a, kind of a different culture. It's a Very much place. so. Yeah. My father um, was really big on work ethic. He was very Teutonic, and he, uh, he really imbued us with this knowledge of, of how to work, which is taught. Mm -hmm. That's uh, great ethic. He uh, was an engineer, and they'd come home and change into his old army clothes, and cut down trees. The Dutch elm disease kept us going for many oh, a year. And there were trees. the four kids. And we loaded more firewood, cut more brush. Uh, we, I mean, I think I have a good back to this day because of all the uh -huh. wood we loaded. But really got to, to learn how to work hard. But I never learned how to play hard. Hmm. And New Orleans taught me celebration. Oh, good. It taught me cooking. It taught me dancing. It taught me laughter. I don't think I laugh any place harder than I laugh in New Orleans. Uh, th they, they throw a party if their baby cuts their first tooth. 
and <laughs> that's in me too. <laughs> Isn't it nice that life can take you on journeys to yes. different places yes. that help balance your life? And you gather. And you gather and that you have phases to your life. Mm -hmm. And we were talking before the program today about how you have different phases, and you've been through different phases. Yes, I have. And at first, you were uh, into sculpting mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And how did you uh, design those people? How big were they? In? It started in college. Uh, I was fascinated with just learning everything I could about people. And I was you know, poor as a little mouse. So I started making um, sculpture out of what I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. uh, old used clothes, dog hair, uh, little trinkets from the thrift shop. And I made these people that stood about this high. And some of them were fantastic and some of them were just the person around the corner. Some, you know, one might be a plump little housewife in rollers and I'd make her a clothesline and she'd be hanging up all of her clothes and with clothespins in her mouth. Uh, and then, mm. you know, the, the next thing would be some sort of a wizard with a bird's nest in his beard. Just mm -hmm. collecting these different people, these different faces. And their, their uh, faces were high fire stoneware. Uh, so they were fired in a kiln, but their, their bodies were this compilation of all different things. and. I like to think that they were really special because dogs barked at them. Really? And I've, I've seldom seen dogs respond to art, but they used to bark at my sculptures. <laughs> so I knew they had something going uh -huh. for them. Yes, that's great. That's I great. I showed them all over the country, uh, uh -huh. Madison Avenue and San Francisco and uh, New Orleans. I was having one-man shows two or three times a year. You had a famous movie actor, Dustin Hoffman, yes. take a particular note of your sculptor? Yes, right? I did a quilt called My First Airplane Ride, and it was the first piece I ever showed in New York. And I was so naive that I thought, well, th it's just up from here. You know, Dustin Hoffman bought my first piece, and I really didn't sell to another celebrity for another <laughs> 10 years, but it <laughs> did put a feather in my bonnet. It was very uh, exciting. That's great. That's great. And then um, you uh, were there in New York, and then you uh, came back. You, you moved to Edgartown. Well, it's a story of romance. Uh -huh. I had lived in Edgartown the summer of Jaws. Uh -huh. And boy, that has some surreal memories to it. 74? It's around there. 74, yeah, I think it was. And uh -huh. I'd made friends with various vineyarders that are friends of mine to this day. Mm -hmm. And then I moved down to New Orleans and was gone that period of time. Mm -hmm. And a handsome fisherman came down to New Orleans to visit my former beau. And we fell in love. And I oh. moved up to uh, Martha's Vineyard to make my nest. And uh, the rest is history. That's a wonderful story. That's wonderful. And so uh, with your first child, you were moving into the, the 1980s, yes. and you noticed around you a lot of white walls and, yes. and naughty pine. Everywhere. Everywhere. They, it, it was, that was the decor of the late 70s, early 80s. It was just white sheetrock, very highly polished with urethane, naughty pine, no color. And no rheostats on any lights. There was there the, 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 the place was kind of lacking a certain sensuality and color. And here I am coming right back from New Orleans and thinking, oh, lots of color. Down here. Let's you know, let's spread a little joy here. Let's let's get out the brushes. And I had no idea how to paint. I just knew I could. Mm -hmm. And mural painting is a fascinating way to learn to paint because it can take a person an artist in so many different directions. There's so many periods to study. There's so many uh, different um, decors. And so mural painting was uh, inviting me to try 
a hundred different things mm -hmm. in, in every direction. Yeah, we, we were talking in one of our discussions about the different, uh, uh, at, at the end of every century or yes. end of every, every decade, you were talking about the Belle Epoque and the Victorian era, um, how voluptuousness mm. of mm -hmm. figures and forms, the Japanese influence, minimalism, um, the mission furniture, all these different phases. Right. And that you noticed here in the vineyard that there was a, a need and you so you took and fused all that the great knowledge you have your great grasp on all the this art history and you talked about um, that there was public art mm -hmm. and so you you went through some commercial phases mm -hmm. and did some different books for uh, illustrations with Carly Simon and mm -hmm. and some others and you've been in um, the Rolling Stone and the New York Times, the Boston Globe, House and Garden, m many different mediums, National Public Radio and CNN, all these different mediums uh, of media to help get your word out of your great ideas. But you talk to me a, a little bit about the personal side of your work and how it um, you like to share the kind of the transcendence of your thoughts during a year. How do you do that? And what are some of your thoughts that influence your work that you create over a year? Well, I have different compartments inside of myself. Um, and each of those compartments has different intentions and requires different, somewhat subtly different skill sets. When I'm painting for a client and I'm doing a mural, I'm listening very closely to what they're um, searching for. Mm. Uh, they might not even know it. I might have to use some like empathy in order to help bring them to a place where they arrive at what they're hoping for. It might even be an, an emo I want, like I ask them uh, often, what are you going, what's going to happen in this room? What do you want to have happen in this room? Yeah. And we begin to imagine where we want to go. Sometimes a client knows exactly what they want and I am just there to execute it. Other times it's, it's kind of like going on a walk on the beach with them where we're dreaming together, we're coming up with different things, I propose mm -hmm. different ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm working with their space and it's very intimate to work with someone's space who really want to have them be comfortable in their own homes. So there's a little psych 101 going on and it, oh, it's- Psych 101, it's, more like f <laughs> five or 600 level. It's, <laughs> Empathic art history. Right, exactly. <laughs> yes. and, and, and really trying to feel them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like a residential job is one intention then, you, then there are commercial spaces where we are asking, what do we want to have happen here? Is this a dance club? Is this a romantic restaurant? Uh, what, is the, what is my client's Lola's. budget? <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, what, uh, what kind of excitement or uh, romance or serenity are we uh, inviting into this space? How can we do this? How can we do this at this budget? Because that's always a consideration is, I'm not just painting something and throwing it up there. I am given a budget, I am given a schedule, and it's sort of like Iron Chef, only <laughs> I'm painter, I'm just like, you know, working away and trying to slide in under the line. And, um, you know, sometimes the considerations is abuse, like how beat up is this mural going to get? I mean, w w you know, what, uh, you know. It's the end, end product going to be. Yes, exactly. How's it going to be treated and accepted? Maintenance and uh -huh. all of that sort of yes. thing. Yes. Uh -huh. um, public work is yet another thing. Public work is um, what I'm really excited about now because I love the notion of audience. Uh, there. I once wrote an essay to myself about artists' intentions. Mm. And some artists I call spelunkers or cave explorers. They're very introverted. They're exploring deeply inside of themselves. Um, their most intense, pure essence of their being. Um, it can be very painful. 
Some artists don't even survive it. Probably the perfect example of this kind of spelunking is Van, Van Gogh, mm -hmm. where it's just, it's the ultimate in intimacies, mm -hmm. and it's lonely. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these artists survive their journey, and they are able to share it, even within their lifetime. But it's a, it is a very specific, singular journey. Then there are other artists that I call servants of beauty. And servants of beauty are filters. They drink in beauty. It filters through them, out their fingertips, onto the canvas. And these are the people who paint the beautiful landscapes, the beautiful portraits, the beautiful um, still lives. And with this beauty washing through them, they color their experience. And by putting it down, they're bringing you through their experience and how they ex experience beauty. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you've, and you've done beautiful, I want to say public examples of that. Oh, I, want to, I want to say at the Whaling Church in Edgartown, you were able to help discover or rediscover something that's part of the history as you brought it to life. You know, I and like so, where so many places we've had murals that get painted over or oh, yeah. hidden or whatever, <laughs> or plywooded or, or yeah. sheetrocked over. I have it. To change history. But it, you have actually rescued art yeah. through your public arts. And you, you help, help tell a story that greets people as they mm -hmm. come in through the terminal oh. at Steamship Authority. That's one of the first things that help people to develop their self worth. And, and we talked, I want to make sure we, we take time to talk about this, that um, we're talking about the phases of the, ar the archetypal th theme of, of the mermaid. Right. And we talked about the woman and, and that w women are torn mm -hmm. between, well, let, let me have you talk about that. I think there's a lot of... Talk about mermaids. Psychology in my work, as I explained before, even engaging with the client and, and trying to read their hearts and intentions and souls. Um, while I'm painting, I spend a lot of time ruminating about different things. I'm all the while, my mind is, is going around chewing the big bones of the meaning of life. And at one phase in my life, uh, I identified with what I call an archetype, which is the mermaid. And she represented to me um, a feminine dilemma of having at once to be expected to be poised, thinking, discerning, um, professional, mm -hmm. uh, having good judgment, restraint, and then attached to that same psyche is another whole psyche of wanting to be free, independent, wildish, impulsive, spontaneous, um, alluring, mm -hmm. uh, sexy, whatever mm -hmm. that all that tail stuff is. Mm -hmm. And here we are, joined right in the middle. And are we swimming against odds, or are we swimming together? The, the, the dilemma of the mermaid became a, um, a source of uh, you know, contemplation and humor mm -hmm. and uh, therapy actually for myself because I, I needed to work out things on that level myself. In this very small community, um, I became very self-conscious about good behavior. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is Mark Twain says, uh, if, you, if there's something you want to do and you don't want anyone to know about it, don't do it. And that is wise counsel. On the other hand, what do we do with that wonderful, luscious, exciting part of ourselves? Where, where does that go? How do we create a certain balance? A, a word that became very important to me was poise. How do we become poised? Mm -hmm. Where we balance these energies within ourselves in a way where we can have it all because that's what I wanted. I wanted yeah. to have it all. <laughs> and, and did that help you in uh, writing your book, A Survival Guide for Landlocked Mermaids? You know, it's very interesting. Uh, I never thought of it as a book. I was just 
these paintings were just pouring out and with them came these some little writings and different things like that and one day one of my dear girlfriends said you know Margaret this is a book and I said oh right uh -huh. and she said no no it's a book like like it would have a title like a survival guide for landlocked mermaids and as soon as she said the title I can't take credit for it as soon as she said the title I thought it is a book uh -huh. that's it that's the purse string and um, I went and created this book and it actually sold to Simon and Schuster. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> That's was, good. Yeah. That's great. Well, the, uh, the Survival Guide is uh, an, uh, another example, but we were talking a little bit about um, the, the deeper philosophical aspects, but, and, and we could go on even more about that. It, it, you, you mentioned a great quote about love. It is love. Oh, it's love that loves through us. Mm -hmm. And um, something that I've thought about and worked on in myself is to get out of the way of what's pouring through me. Mm -hmm. Try to be as together as I can possibly be so that I don't block all of this wonderful energy that's, that's flying through me all these great ideas. I mean, the only stumbling block is me. Mm -hmm. And they come out through your fingertips. That's right. And so I want our viewers to see a bunch of your images here. Oh, great. So uh, I want to talk about, uh, there are many books that I know that I have that you illustrated, several of them I brought today, like Amy the Dancing Bear. My first. Yes, this is, this is a great little, uh, Great little book. Oh, that was such an adventure. I remember uh, when Carly asked me to do that, I thought, me? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, oh, gosh, that was, that was a, a really good example of how I would dive into I love the detail project. of how every letter here has uh, flowers tied in. And, mm. and then uh, I look through here, and so many pages have the color purple and green. Yes. Of course, the vineyard is, we love purple here in Martha's we Vineyard. We do. And, uh, but what a great little story and the, the choice of the font. But, but the illustrations have beautiful uh, symmetry and cho choice of the colors and the hues. That the, this is wallpaper that has flowers patterned on it. And, you know, it's just a lovely book. Thank you. One example. And, and then you've got the, the, uh, the nighttime chauffeur mm -hmm. is another example. Those originals were this big. They're huge. That's They're what large. allowed me to have like the really fine detail in them. Mm -hmm. I have to say that working with Carly was one of the greatest things of my life, mm -hmm. one of the greatest happenings. Yeah. Look, look at this, the vivid colors. Yes. They're beautiful and it's positive. It's, it's what... Uh, I know that reading stories to children yes. teaches them to love reading. Right, and, and pictures. And, and pictures, and, and that their lives are important and validated, mm -hmm. and that they're loved. And that goes back to your quote, it is love that loves through us. I think we can feel the love in art. I had an experience once that was it's so amazing. I walked into this room and there was a very large, large, impressive painting. And next to it was a tiny painting. And even though we were really far away from the painting, the tiny painting had such power, I couldn't even see what it was. Mm -hmm. And yet it pulled me to it like a portal. And it was a Thomas Hart Benton. Whoa. A little, beautiful, uh, it wasn't a finished, it was like a, a, a painted sketch. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's the mighty, mighty soul of a painting. Mm -hmm. And I think we can feel that soul when we're around original art. That's amazing you mentioned that, because uh, a good friend of mine years ago gifted me a painting of Thomas Hart Benton's home oh. uh, right at the town line between Chilmark wow. and, and Gay Head. And uh, of all the things, she said, what would you like? I said, that calls to me, I'd like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that it was Thomas Hart Benton that you mentioned. We can yeah, feel the can. artist in the art. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it, it, 
the work has a soulfulness to it that I think enlarges each of our own souls by being around it. And that's why public art is so exciting. There's some terrible public art out there mm -hmm. where I yes. think, who was on the selection committee here? Because this is, this is not uplifting. This is not... Um, it's not art. It, it isn't. It's just, I don't know, just a, a big mess. But great public art is transformational. It is very word. exciting. It is transformational. And perhaps there are many people that are um, unschooled or disconnected mm -hmm. from their hearts. Mm -hmm. And they need time to reassess and revalue mm -hmm. what they know about beauty. And to, to reconnect refreshed. them, refresh them. Refresh. I hope our show today is going to help inspire people to refresh mm -hmm. their knowledge of art and their exposure to be the beauty that's around them. I was just, we were talking about these flowers. These are some of the first, this is my first rose from June from the art. But how these flowers know that they need to bloom. Mm -hmm. That's their their essence for living right. and that um, they don't worry about cloudy skies or whatever is going on around them. They'll grow wherever they're given some soil and some water and some sunshine and that um, we need to encourage other people or we benefit so much as we share with other people mm -hmm. and help re-nurture. But, but that's really a key to life. It's, it, joy is contagious. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so are some negative aspects mm -hmm. of life. But joy is really contagious. It's irresistible if you're around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, to have the task of, you know, pumping up the jam, making uh -huh. the joy bigger. <laughs> I mean, I, I raise my hand for that, you know. Well, you'll be pumping up the jam with a show here in August, aren't you? Gonna yeah. Be gonna tell me, uh, tell our viewing audience where it's going to be okay, and great. when. It's August 5th mm -hmm. at the Grange Hall from 4 till 8. It's a one-night happening. It is a love fest. It's really, really fun. I paint 12 paintings about things that are very personally close to my heart. Mm -hmm. They're metaphorical. This year's show is Wondrous Wearables and worthy words. I'm trying, wow. to, I'm trying to defend words, virtues, that are beginning to be endangered. Hmm. Uh, qualities that, don't, that seem to be trampled on now, virtues, mm -hmm. and illuminate them um, through Good. visuals and, and words, and then uh, really ridiculous wearables, like I just finished <laughs> This really funny painting um, called it, it's His and Hers. It's two paintings that work as one. Um, Slow down, darling, turtle time shoes. <laughs> and we have a lot shoes, of turtle crossings on the venue. shoes made out of turtles and snails and all these slow moving things. And in this culture, you know, we're supposed to hurry up and hurry up and hurry up. This is much more a slow down, darling type of uh, metaphor for I us like to that. just kind of get into the moment a little bit more. That's good. Well, we want our viewers to know about that show. Say, so is that the Grange Hall? Yes. That's the, the old fairgrounds, right? That's in, right. In West Isbury Center. That's right. On August 5th. August 5th. It's a Saturday. Saturday at? Saturday. Four to eight. Four to eight. Good. Well, we want our viewing audience to see that and, and hope that you'll come out. Margo, our time has just slipped by so quickly. And it's wonderful that you've shared your feelings and thoughts and how they've come out through your fingertips oh. in beautiful art over the years. Thank and you. Uh, I wish you the very best. Thank and you. thank you for being my guest today. And thank you for being my view viewing audience. I'm Jim Powell, your host. And we've had Margot Datz here today sharing some wonderful ideas and thoughts and art with you. And I hope that you'll help share this show and talk to other people about it and the importance of art in your life. And uh, we'll see you again real soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>